The Pair Affair, Chapter 30. When they rang the bell to Coco's apartment, Coco answered immediately. Seeing who her visitors were, her face broke out into a delighted grin. A million miles from the suspicion with which she had greeted Nell and Nige at the theatre. I saw it on the news, she cried, ushering them into the large living room. You should all be fated. That was a marvellous thing you did. I always knew that, mayor, that the mayor was bad news. It was a beautiful apartment with high ceilings and four large windows looking out onto the swaying treetops of the Boulevard Saint-Germain. One wall was lined with books, poetry and plays and stories that Nell could see Nisha's eyes were instantly drawn to. Another wall was covered in paintings, giant canvases that all seemed to hum and vibrate with splashy colour. On the floor, a Turkish rug gleamed with reds and pinks and oranges, and there were two egg-shaped swivel chairs that the twins threw themselves into, imploring Zav and Satine to spin them around. Colette and Emil stood side by side, shyly, looking around the place with unconcealed awe. Without the white gunk, Coco had the most expressive face Nell had ever seen. She was all eyes and nose and mouth, none of which seemed to fit, and yet altogether they were perfect. Cherie, she said, draping her arm around Nell's shoulder, leading her to the couch. The fact that the magnificence are embroiled in this spore thing will be music to Paris' ears. At last, she will be free. Have you seen Per then? Where is she? Broke in Nell. There was so much to ask. Listen, I will explain everything, said Coco, plumping up the cushions of the couch and pushing Nell gently down. But first of all, let me get you all something to eat and drink. Emil, is it? Can you help me? Mikel dusted down his overalls, then lowered himself onto the sofa next to Nell. The suspense, eh? He said, his eyes twinkling. I wish you and young Xavier had told me what was going on. Zav said not to said Nell. He would say that. Thinks he can manage everything, but sometimes... He managed really well, said Nell loyally. She looked over at Zav, who, with Soutine, was still spinning the twins round. He had gone to find Coco this morning. She hadn't asked him to, but he had known how much it meant to her. Here we are, said Coco bearing a tray laden with glasses of lemonade. Emile followed a plate in each hand, piled high with sugary apple doughnuts. They're not from Pantastique, said Coco quickly. The boulangerie round the corner miraculously escaped the thing. When they had all collected a drink and a doughnut and Coco had told them she didn't mind sugary finger marks on the furniture. It's nothing soap and water can't fix, she said. She made them all sit down. Zav squeezed in between Mikhail and Nell and gave her a reassuring smile. Perrine and I met when we were only 14 years old, Coco began, sitting cross-legged in the middle of the rug so that she had a clear view of every room, everyone. We were both runaways and for a short while we lived together in the tunnels because we had nowhere else to go. You lived in the tunnels, exclaimed Mikhail, at that age? We did, and it was, it was only us two, said Coco, fixing her gaze on Nell. Paris had a baby with her, and I think you know, Nell, that baby was you. A collective gasp flashed around the room. There was a thud as Paul fell out of the egg-shaped chair. Nige, who had been reaching for a book, stopped still, one arm frozen in midair. So she did steal me, said Nell. Why would Per do that? Who from? Stop it. She didn't steal you, said Coco fiercely, rising to her knees. She saved you. She didn't want you to suffer the same fate that she had suffered. What fate? Nell had an image of Per as Rapunzel again, her face pressed up against a narrow window, calling to be let out. Fourteen years of heartlessness, of loneliness, of being told she was worth nothing and would never amount to anything, said Coco with great feeling. It sounded strangely familiar, thought Nell. In her head, she could hear Melinda and Gerald calling her a tiresome sneak over and over again. She grew up in a children's home run by an awful couple called Monsieur and Madame Bessett. 
She was a foundling. Do you know what that is? An abandoned baby, offered Paul. He was back in the egg-shaped chair, but both he and Paulette had stopped spinning. <clears throat> Pear had always been telling stories about foundlings and runaways, and Nell was starting to understand why. That's right, Paul. Foundlings never know who their real mothers and fathers are. For a split second, a cloud passed across Coco's face and Nell remembered the headline splashed across Paris Match below Coco's picture. From rags to riches, Paris find Parisian foundling makes it big. She felt a tug of sympathy for Coco. Coco was a foundling too, and she would have her own story to tell. When she turned 13, Coco continued, the Bess had sent Perry out to learn needlework at the house of a lady nearby. It opened Perry's eyes and she glimpsed another world. She adored the craft. She found she had an aptitude for it. But then the lady moved away, the visit stopped and life went horribly back to normal. As the story slumped, Coco sprang up. She had the grace of a cat, a lightness of movement, thought Nell. She began to prowl back and forth across the rug. She couldn't bear it any longer, burst out Coco, making them all jump. So she decided to run away. The time was right. She was 14, old enough to get an apprenticeship. Just like you, Nige, said Paulette. But on the morning she left, as she crept through the sleeping house, she heard a tiny mewling sound coming from the kitchen. Was it? asked Zav. She thought it might be a kitten, so she went to look. But it was not a kitten, it was a baby, tucked up in the dresser drawer, far away from the Bessett's room, so they could pass the night undisturbed. Coco paused. It was very odd, thought Nell. Coco still looked like Coco, and yet she had become Pear. They all watched, mesmerised, as Coco Pear gazed down at the imaginary drawer, torn between, not knowing whether to stay or run away. Nell could see why she was such a celebrated actor. Gently, Coco picked up the little bundle, cradled it in her arms. Nell felt tears pricking her eyes. It was déjà vu, said Coco. Perry herself had been in that very same drawer 14 years before. Perhaps she could just have walked straight by, but how could she turn away from such a tiny, innocent, defenceless baby? Of course she couldn't burst out Zav. I would have taken you, said Nige, turning to Nell with shiny eyes. Aunt me, said the twins together. And Nell could tell from the look on Satine's face that he would have taken her too. The short story is, she did take you. And in Paris, after we met, we took it in turns to look after you while she was out looking for apprenticeships and I auditioned. It was 1957. We lived in a lovely cavern. We made it so hom homely. We called you Pitti Minou because you, your cries sounded like a tiny kitten's. The fruit box cradle, the one Mimi had tucked her little mouse torch up in, that had Manu scratched on it. It must have been Nell's. But then you got sick and it got too much and Paris saw the advertisement on the notice board at the American church. Coco stopped. Her expression was grave. Remember, she was young. We had no money. What else could she do? What was the advertisement? asked Mikhail, frowning from a couple desperate to adopt a baby. Melinda and Gerald, said Nell slowly. But I don't understand. How could they be so desperate? If they were desperate, they would have loved me, wouldn't they? They never cared for me, not one jot. It was something to do with the magnificent board, the sty, stip. Coco grasped for the words and then stopped eyes wide. Outside, footsteps could be heard thudding up the stairs. The door flew open. The stipulations! Nell's mouth dropped open. Standing in the door was a young woman, 
face flushed golden curls caught up in a green velvet ribbon. The woman stepped inside. It was all to do with the hateful stipulations, she cried. Another gasp ricocheted across around the room. The timing couldn't have been more perfect. This was better than any live theatre show. Pear! Nell rubbed her eyes, rubbed them again. Nell! cried Pear. A warmth like Nell had never felt before flooded her entire being. The thing she had hoped and waited for, dreamed of for all these years, was finally coming true. Pear was here and she was striding across the room towards her and everyone was cheering and whooping and Nell was certain she saw Zav brushing away a tear. I came as quick as I could, said Pear, grasping Nell's hands in her own. Nell felt her chest rise and swell and then crash in a wave of sheer happiness. Pear was here, she had come, she had kept her word. Nell had always known deep down she could trust Pear. Nell threw herself into Pear's arm and then she was sobbing and Pear was sobbing and Paul and Paulette were doing a sort of mad polka around the room and then Coco was flinging herself on them too. Reunited, a family again. And Zav and Nij and the others were grinning from ear to ear and there was laughter and tears and Nell felt delirious with happiness. She and Pear had been apart for so long and yet everything felt right and nothing had changed. It was all the fault of the stipulations, Pear exp uh, explained Pear. Melinda and Gerald could only inherit, inherit magnificent foods if they were able to prove that they had an heir. It's called the Magnificent Clause, she said. There was a distant cousin in America who already had a child. They were worried that if they didn't act quickly, the company would go to him. It was dawn and Nell and Pear were sitting on the Quai d'Orsay, a short stroll from Coco's apart apartment. Their legs dangled over the Seine, the water rippling like silvery feathers in the early morning breeze. They hadn't slept. They had too much to talk about, but Mel di Nell didn't feel the slightest bit tired. Oh, Nell, I thought I had found us both a home and some, sec some security. It seemed so perfect. They wanted me to come and take care of you. And of course I came because I couldn't bear to be parted from you. But as soon as we got to London, I understood why they wanted you and saw that I had, to, that I had made a terrible mistake. But we were happy, you and me, said Nell. We were, said Pear. I was determined to give you all the love that they couldn't. And for a while that worked, especially as most of the time they stayed out of our way. But then I discovered that they were going to send you to boarding school and sent me back to Paris. Melinda had even arranged the apprenticeship for me at Crown Couture, a sort of bribe, I suppose. And so I determined that we would run away. How could I have forgotten that? It didn't come clear in my memory until today, said Nell. You were so young, said Pear, squeezing Nell's arm. I'm not sure you really understood what was happening. Anyway, they caught us just as we were leaving, said I couldn't have it both ways. There was a terrible scene. Melinda threatened to call the police and get me arrested for kidnapping you in the first place. And oh, I don't know, Pear wiped her eyes and sighed. She was the, mo the more powerful one with all the money and the connections. So you went, said Nell. Yes, but I vowed that as soon as I had made something of myself and as soon as I could support you, I would come back and get you. And you nearly did. Six months ago, I wrote to Melinda telling her I was going to the police and come clean. I was going to admit to taking you from the children's home. I wanted to do, it, to do it properly this time, so no more sneaking away in the middle of the night. But she didn't like that, said Nell. She didn't like it at all. Instead, she planted her brooch on me at Crown Couture and made me out to be a thief. I lost my job. I couldn't pay the rent on my apartment. I was in danger of becoming destitute all over again. Thank goodness for Coco. It was pure coincidence when she ordered a dress from Crown Couture and we became friends again. When I lost my job, she asked me to finish the dress for her privately and she suggested I move in. 
That's when you wrote this, said Nell, drawing the letter out of her pocket. But where does the mayor fit in? Why did he issue a warrant for your arrest? Because being dismissed from Crown Couture didn't stop me, said, said Per fiercely. I wouldn't give up. I wrote to the magnificent board laying everything bare. bare. When Melinda and Gerald found out, they must have been furious. It was them that asked the mayor to issue a warrant for my arrest. I imagine it was initially part of the deal they were striking over this Spore 13. But Melinda and Gerald were too greedy, said Nell. Yes, Nell, they stole the recipe for this thing instead of honouring their agreement. And then the mayor, desperate to get it back, saw an opportunity to blackmail you into helping him. She paused to hug Nell again. But you were too clever. And were you out of the country, asked Nell, the whole time I've been here? I must have been on my way to London when you were on your way here, said Per. I went with Coco's lawyer to meet with the magnificent board and a representative from Scotland Yard. But are you going to be okay, said Nell, as a new wave of worry washed over her. Is there a warrant still out for your arrest? I'm seeing the inspector tomorrow, said Per, with the lawyer and the chap from Scotland Yard. They think it'll be okay. They say I have a good case. We did it together, said Nell. We did, said Per. Oh, Nell, you don't know how often I've worried that I did the wrong thing all those years ago. Perhaps if I had left you with the Bessons, one day your real mother might have come back to claim you. Nell was quiet for a moment. It was true that she would never know who her real mother and father were, or find out whether she had been wanted or not. But Per had found her. Per had fought for her. She had not abandoned her. Per, you wanted me, she said, and I want you, and that's enough.